my name is Mike Gabin and welcome to my KSP campaign. I am just here in the tracking station. I have the next module of my Dreads Explorer sitting on the pad, but it needs to rendezvous with this ship that is in this 20 degree inclined orbit. And in order to do that, I must launch at either the ascending or the descending node of that target orbit. But as you can see here, the KSC has actually just moved to the east of the, what looks like the descending node. So I have just missed that launch window. That's okay. I got another one coming up on the other side of the planet. Of course, that's going to be a little less than three hours away. So in the meantime, I think we need to get ourselves over to the moon where I have the Kegel 4, which has just touched down at the end of the last episode. Now you may recall that this thing actually touched down in the dark, so our solar panels are not generating any power. However, I thought in the meantime, we can do some of the less electric electrically intensive things like going out here and planting some flags. So we'll, we'll get Stala out, our pilot first. And we'll uh, look at getting some flags here on the ground. And uh, while we disembark everybody else and get ready to do some flag planting, you might also recall towards the end of the last episode that I briefly visited with Moho One, which is now less than three hours away from its encounter with Moho. So we got a lot of things happening all sort of around the same time, but, uh, you know, we can get started here and uh, get some flags down on the ground. Yeah, I think it's Bob that should have the honor here. I think he's the most experienced one. He's our commander, so we'll get him to put the flag down. And uh, well, let me see. Ah, no, you know what? I'm just going to put in Kegel 4 for the site name. And I think on the plaque. I'll just put the name of the crew here. So we got Bob, we got Chris Nick beside him. Beside Chris Nick, we have our pilot. It took me a moment to remember who she was. <laughs> Get people mixed up, but eventually I did recall that it is Stala that is there. And then beside Stala is our rookie scientist, Shell Cal. And there we go. And of course, don't forget, you want to get actually everybody to be planting flags. Uh, you can delete them afterwards, but you do get experience, additional experience beyond just walking on the surface of, the, of a body. You get additional experience for planting the flags. So do make sure that all your Kerbals, if they get down on the surface of another body, all plant the flags, even if you do plan to simply just delete those flags afterwards. And as Stala gets rid of her last flag. It's time to go over to Bob. We have one more contract we need to fulfill before this is all done, and that is to go to the nearby Moon Arch. So Bob is the one that's going to get the job, the distinction of being able to go over there. And we'll just fly close enough in order for us to get our message. There we go. Okay, let's uh, get Bob down. <laughs> Maybe we should hang some decorations from the arch to spruce the place up a bit. From P.R. Kerman. Um, thanks. Well, that's hopefully the last time we hear from the P.R. department. And that takes care of our contract obligations and our experience obligations. Now it's time to get into our science obligations and I do want to be transmitting science so it's time to check on the electricity so we'll just get Bob back inside and then we can see what the situation is yeah we've lost about half of our electric charge that's in storage and we're still not generating any power so I think I gotta bite the bullet here and start up that fuel cell so click on that, start the fuel cell okay we are generating power so let's get shell cow back inside as well and let's start uh, doing some science so we'll start off with the sort of standard science that you've seen before I do have a lab module aboard and I plan on using it so that means we are going to be collecting science we're going to be transmitting everything that we can then we're going to be collecting again we're going to be processing as much as that science module 
the lab module will hold as far as scientific data. It's not a particularly big one, but we'll take what we can. And then finally, we will collect everything that we can again and take back whatever science happens to be left. And it turned out, once all that was taken care of, that the sun had finally come up enough to be starting to work on the solar panels. Even though you can't see the sun over the horizon, the solar panels are starting to pick up charge. So I was able to turn off the fuel cell. Hardly used any fuel at all actually doing all that. And uh, now it's time to get into the second phase of collecting science because I do have equipment from the Surface Science Pack mod, <laughs> which uh, I've used before, but only in and around the KSC. So this is the first time I've used it far away. And in fact, in the past, what I've done is I've had it attached to a rover. So I haven't had to spend too much time setting it all up. So I'm running this in fast motion here. So you can see it does take a fair bit. This gives your Kerbals definitely something to do on the surface of other bodies, having to set this all up. And you do need an engineer to put this stuff all together. But all told, there are eight experiments here that you can do. Uh, and, and they're pretty significant. I mean, they, they range in, um, in uh, value, in scientific value, from a low end of about 30 science to about uh, four of them actually have 72 science each. So that turns into quite the science hall. And you can see as well that you can transmit well, I believe I transmitted all of it. All told here, uh, let's read off the various science experiments that you can do. Actually, wait, I said if there were seven. There are actually eight. There is uh, a little bit of science that you can get from the actual command, little command hub that you start from the beginning, sort of a, I think it's a systems check, but it's worth a little bit of science. But past that, there is a heat sensor. There is a solar wind spectrometer. There is a cold cathode neutral ion detector. Is it just me? I mean, uh, chemistry was never really my thing, but don't the word neutral and ion uh, conflict with one another? Doesn't an ion, oh, well, anyway, whatever. <laughs> we have a passive seismic experiment. We also have a surface gravity meter, we have a surface magnetometer, and then finally we have a retro reflector. Uh, the retro reflector actually being modeled after an actual for real reflector that was put down by Apollo astronauts on the moon that is used to measure distances to the surface of the moon with great accuracy. Anyway, we were, Bob's just out here. He's just collecting science, transmitting what he can, and oh dear, we are out of electricity. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, the electricity here is being generated by three sets of solar panels that are attached to the little sort of command hub that is there at the beginning. So we'll get Chris Nick out. I do have one more set of panels that I can attach here to kind of... Uh, Spruce this up just a little bit. All right, there we go. That looks better. Had to reshuffle the solar panels with that fourth one added on there. They look like they should all be charging. So that will charge up the station once again. That'll take a little bit of time. So in the meantime, what we'll do is we'll get Chris Nick. Uh, he'll move around and uh, start cleaning up the experiments that were already taken care of. You know what would have been even smarter, I was just thinking about this sort of well after the fact, is, I mean, the, the station is generating, actually, or the station, the lander is actually generating quite a bit of power. Uh, it has much bigger solar panels, obviously, than this does. I, I bet you I could have hooked it up with a, a pair of KAS fuel pipe endpoints and share the resources that are in the lander and run off the power that is in the lander. Unfortunately... I didn't think about it, and I don't have any fuel pipes along with me here on the surface of the moon. So we're going to have to rely on the solar panel, on the solar that this thing can generate just on its own. But that's okay. Actually, while I'm watching Chris Nick take this apart, I bet you I could have taken that, see that hub that's there with all the plugs in it? I bet you I could have stuck that to the lander and just used the plugs that are provided with this thing and just plugged into the lander. I bet you that would have worked. I'll have to give that a try. 
And the other thing I started thinking about while this thing was charging was I took a look at our map and we are just to the north, and I mean just to the north of the east crater. It is just over a lip that is just behind us here. And we have landed in the east crater before, but we've never taken this science experiment stuff into the east crater before. And it is quite the science hall. And I'm really considering, is, is it worth, well, I mean, I've got four Kerbals. They can all help carry stuff. The EVA, the whole crew of them down there carrying down science stuff. I think that might be worth it. I'll have to consider that. But in the meantime, um, the, you know, once the station was all charged, Bob was able to go and collect the rest of this science and transmit back what he could. And then I took a look at the orbit and took a look at where the Karayan 1 is. This, these guys do have to rendezvous with the Karayan 1. And that orbit has already moved uh, to the west of us. So I could do two things. I can launch right now and, uh, and, and do a bit of an inclination change and rendezvous with the Karayan. Or I can wait. I mean, the sun has just come up. In a little less than three days, uh, we will be matching up with the other side of the Karayan's orbit. All of that should be during the day. They're generating lots of power. They have six days of life support. What I think I'll do is I think I will wait. I think I will let these guys spend a day, uh, a Moonar day, on the moon. And uh, in the meantime, I will think about what I'm going to do with the surface science stuff. But what I really want to do is get to Moho 1, which is closing in on our first planetary encounter but geez look at this 948 science I've got to spend this and spend it I did and I decided what I wanted what I really need is bigger rocket so I went with uh, bigger rockets with uh, large volume containment and very heavy rocketry as the two nodes that I unlocked but without any further ado let's get ourselves out to Moho we're still outside of Moho's sphere of influence, but I thought I would make a bit of a course correction here, bring my periapsis down. I do want to draw attention to the signal delay, now over 49 seconds, so it takes over 49 seconds to put in a command uh, to the vessel. So basically all of your maneuvers pretty much have to be done with the remote tech flight computer. That's, of course, the light delay. There's Moho right there. You can see it. That's cool. Okay, this is very... There it is. There it is. Very tiny burn. Okay. We'll put the thrust limiter back up, which, funny enough, the tweaking doesn't require a signal delay. I don't think Remote Tech ever figured that out. Let's take a look. Okay, we're about 21 kilometers inclination it's not 90 degrees but i have a contract uh to do some scanning but it has to be in a specific orbit with an inclination of about 85 degrees so i'm going to leave that alone until i'm in moho's sphere of influence so let's set up an alarm here hour and 33 minutes you can see what also is coming up is the uh vehicle assembly building is being upgraded in just under that time the other thing, though, I want to take a look at is um, my launch window for my command module. I looked at this at the beginning of the video. Just missed my launch window. Again, I have to rendezvous with the ship that is in an inclined orbit about Kerbin. There's the inclined orbit. So that means I need to launch at either the ascending or the descending node. So we're coming up now to the ascending node. There it is, where it crosses... Kerbin's equator. So that's where I need to launch. Um, the KFC is marked by that light blue. There's a blue uh, waypoint there. It's very light. Right there. There it is. So I, it's got to move around to about there. Which uh, is a little over a third of the way around the planet. Kerbin, of course, takes six hours to rotate. So it'll be a little over two hours. If I'm gonna, so that'll be after, yeah, that's gonna be after Moho One crosses into Moho's sphere of influence, and at that point, I'll be pretty busy as it is. So I think I'm going to have to wait on that again 
deal with it after dealing with Moho. I'm just trying to find Moho. There's the sun, there's Moho. So we'll focus in on that. Find Moho 1 and move out there. Here we are, there's Moho 1. Okay, fly. Now this thing just has a single solar panel set on it. So I'm just gonna set this off to the side. I wanna keep an eye on it. Uh, this close to the sun, the single solar panel is going to be more than enough to provide the electricity that I need. The exact opposite situation when I go to Dres, but we'll talk about that later. We'll also talk about, as we time warp towards Moho, I have two antennas that are in orbit about carbon pointed this way because I don't want to have any breaks in communication that I can control. You know, we don't need one of those antennas to drift behind uh, carbon and lose our communication link. Okay, the time warp stopping. And um, that's the vehicle assembly building now built. That's actually uh, a bit of a big deal. Not only does that unlock general action groups for me, but it removes the part restriction. And I mentioned uh, an upcoming launch that, uh, of course, I simulated. That's why I know that this is going to be coming up. Uh, but it really pushed the part count. Uh, I had to actually take off some parts to get it under the part, the 255 part count, I think, that you have on the Tier 2 vehicle assembly building. So with my plan to start getting some bigger launches on the way, uh, having a fully upgraded vehicle assembly building is going to be a big deal. Okay, we are now under five minutes to our first planetary encounter. So let's time warp away the rest of this. Okay, there we go, we'll stop, and uh, we should get ready to do us some science because um, that's going to be the first thing we're going to do once we're into Moho's sphere of influence. There we are, we are there, it's official. Now this thing was launched 149 days ago, and it's been, it's, obviously it's a long journey to get to another planet, and at the time that I launched it, I was quite a bit lower on the tech tree. So this thing actually only has four pieces of equipment as far as science goes. Two of them being ScanSat scanning equipment. I got the low-res altitude scanner and the uh, multi-spectral analyzer, which actually I had just unlocked just before launching this. Um, and that will be scanning the biome. So I'm glad just to have that. Otherwise, it's only a pressure scanner and a thermometer. That's all I got. Note again, the signal delay. Both of those two scans are now being co uh, counted down in the remote tech flight computer. While they're counting down, I'm trying to uh, retract this communitron antenna. And I'm having trouble clicking on it. I was having trouble clicking on things in this particular mission, uh, small parts. Eventually, I did end up retracting it. It's obviously, that's a short-range antenna, which is obviously serving no purpose whatsoever. There is nothing within a short range of this probe right now. But eventually, I got to the point where I had to ignore it here because uh, my science was about to happen. Here comes the first one. There is the pressure scan. Oh, I can't see how much science that is. Let's move that. There's the temperature scan. Temperature scan was 25 science. I'm transmitting this, of course. And the pressure scan was 30, about 38 science. Yeah, everything has to be transmitted. Obviously, this probe is not going back. I obviously, I also never uh, put on like a mystery goo or a materials bay. Didn't bother. <laughs> I just, I don't know. I always like to return those ones. Anyway, uh, according to Kerbal Engineer, I'm in an inclination of 87 degrees. But this uh, ScanSat contract requires me to put this into an orbit with an inclination of about 85 degrees. So I'm going to need to make some sort of normal change here. And I can tell it's going to be, thanks to the right-hand rule, an anti-normal burn to push my trajectory a bit to the right from this view. And if you don't know the right-hand rule, you should look it up. It's, it's useful from time to time. Okay, so we're going to use precise node. We're going to make a... A maneuver here. Oh, uh, it's a little bit close to the craft. Let's push this a little forward in time. I have to take into account the signal delay. And uh, because I don't know what my inclination is actually going to be until after the burn is done, I'm just going to kind of guess at 
I don't know, uh, minus five. Sure, why not? Minus five. We'll burn that, and then we'll see what we got. Okay, Kerbal Engineer says 85.2. Contract is happy. That's awesome. Now, contract also requires the apoapsis to be 495 kilometers. The periapsis as well. This has got to be very close to a circular orbit. Let's put the thrust limiter up to 100%. I want to draw attention to that because uh, that's something that's going to come up for discussion in a little bit. A little bit of a vagarity with uh, remote tech. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's put that back on the periapsis. Okay. So let's start. Let's get rid of that. Okay. So minus 1,500 meters per second. This is, this is only about 30 minutes away. Uh, we are falling fast. Nothing like falling a dozen million kilometers to really uh, pick up some speed. Okay, let's see. We got this at 495. Dial that in a little closer. That'll do. Yeah. Okay, check the contract again. Yep, that should be good. All right, now. Um, let's put it on the node. I always want to make sure that when it goes to the maneuver node attitude, that the solar panels are the way I want them to be. Hmm, I think that could be better. So we'll use a, a bit of a custom heading here. What I want to do is adjust, adjust the, uh, the roll here a little bit. So I'm going to change our heading to zero, our roll to 90, and our pitch to 90. Let's see what that looks like. There it goes. Uh, nope, that's even worse. <laughs> Let's put the roll to zero. Let's see what that's like. Again, waiting for that light delay that remote tech adds in. Few more seconds. Okay, that's good. That's good. The solar panel should orient itself and get some nice exposure from the sun. And now we'll put it on the node and we'll hit execute as well. Oh, remote tech also, well, we don't need that. Remote tech is also putting it on the node shortly before the maneuver gets executed, which is which is good. I mean, you don't want it to start to burn and swing to the node at the same time, but since I already have it on the node, I don't need that part, so we'll cancel that. And we'll just make sure everything is good. When you start adjusting your, your heading and your pitch with remote tech, it shouldn't adjust the roll. So that's why I wanted to get the roll right first. And yeah, now it's on the node, and you can see that uh, it didn't adjust really much at all because we were very close to being on the node. All right, that is pretty much set, so why don't we cut to a point a little bit closer to our burn? Now what's a bit disconcerting is that the nav ball is telling me the burn's going to be 1 minute and 53 seconds. Kerbal Engineer is saying 3 minutes and 24 seconds. Let me check my engine here. No, it's that full thrust. I want to make sure that's... So I don't know why that's confused. We'll see what the flight computer has to say, what remote tech has to say once the burn starts being executed. But the fact that we are just under 3 minutes still from our burn time and here comes the burn. That's a bit disconcerting. Yeah, remote tech thinks the burn's about five minutes. Uh, I don't know where this confusion is coming from, but it happened to me during my practice. And I'll put practice in air quotes, and I'll explain that in a second. But let's uh, adjust the thrust here, and I'll explain why I am doing that. I think that'll be good. I'm looking at the burn time and how much how far away we are from periapsis and trying to sort of 
split split it evenly on either side. That looks about that looks good. Yeah, um, that happened during practice. I hope people are picking up on those air quotes. Um, the first time I did this, uh, I ran into problem. The exact same thing happened. Uh, it started to burn early, and the problem that ended up happening was that because it was burning early, it started lowering my periapsis, and it ended up lowering the periapsis right into Moho. And because of the uh, signal delay, there was by the time it was down into Moho's surface, uh, there was nothing I can do, and well, you know, I crashed <laughs> into Moho. And I was like, what the heck? Did I do something wrong? I don't understand. So that's why earlier I was very much looking at what I have the thrust limiter on this engine set at. This is a homegrown rockets engine. I'm not sure if somehow that's confusing what the burn times are going to be. Ooh, I just got a uh, camera change. Still don't have a capture. My apoapsis is still negative. Anyway, I don't know if it's the homegrown rocket engine that's throwing this off or whatever, but I thought, you know, I'm not going to have some weird, I don't know, I wasn't going to let some sort of glitch like that end up throwing me off. Oh, we are now in uh, low near space to Moho, so I set off those two uh, science experiments, the temperature scan and the pressure scan. They need to go off before we are, or while we're still in near space, but I don't think that is going to be a problem. And I'm watching also my periapsis, and my periapsis is not going down, so that is good. In fact, we're so close to periapsis, I can put the thrust right up to full now. There's no way it's going to push that periapsis down into the atmosphere now. So good, let's go, burn, let's get this burn over with. All right, science time. Transmit that. Transmit the other one. There they go. Okay, that's it for science. And now all we have to do is wait for this finish off its burn. And we are now going up. Excellent. So, absolutely no way we're going to be crashing into Moho. And in fact, now that I look at my apoapsis from Remote Tech, I, or not Remote Tech, Kerbal Engineer, I can see that it is a positive number, which means we have a capture. We're here. This is it. So all we have to do is let this finish off. Oh, we must be coming over the pole. We're getting this. I always love this this camera pan that you get as you uh, as you come across the pole. All right, science is all transmitted. We don't need that anymore. And burn is complete. Let this sort of settle out. Make sure it's still, yep, it's good. Solar's good. Apoapsis. 518 kilometers, that's okay, that can be fixed. We have messages, the first flyby of MOHO, the first science from MOHO, and the first orbit of MOHO, excellent. And of course, what we're going to do is we need to do a few bit further adjustments to our orbit here to satisfy the ScanSat contract, but that isn't going to be a problem. And by the way, if you're doing the capture, maybe some people are wondering, well, why when you do the capture, do you put yourself so low uh, close to the surface, well, that is, again, to take advantage of the Oberth effect. Even if uh, you're going into a bigger orbit, it is better to be as close to the surface as you're comfortable with to do that capture burn and then adjust your orbit afterwards. That's the cheaper way to go. Anyway, with that all set, I think it is time to bring this video to a conclusion. We'll revisit our folks on the moon and we'll get that uh, command module up into orbit and rendezvoused with my Drez vessel in the next episode. I thank you for watching and hope to see you next time.